Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for logging in. My name is Dr. Turanere. Sorry for the late start. I'll do a quick round of introduction. And I'll start with uh, Dr. Maureen Mutua. Say hi to us. Confirm that your mic is working. Good morning, everyone. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Kihara. Good morning, everybody. Glad to be here. Looking forward to an entertainment in knowledge. Thank you, Thank you so much, Dr. Rose. Good morning, everybody. I'm glad to be here. Good morning, everybody. Professor Nzala. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much. And our boss. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's great to see you all. Thank you for joining. And again, our apologies for the slightly late start. Uh, we'll make up in time. Uh, today, we're going to be thinking around issues of pregnancy, management of patients in pregnancy, and issues around preconception planning. And we're joined by an excellent panel of obstetricians and gynecologists. Thank you so much to the team for joining us. We'll also have um, a talk on vaccination and some of the concerns around pregnancy. So feel free to send in your questions as we start so that this can be handled at the end of the session. So uh, just to kick us off, we'll have a case presentation from Dr. Maureen Mutua. Dr. Maureen is an OBSGANI at the University of Nairobi Health Services. Dr. Maureen Karibusana, you can share your screen and go ahead. Maureen, are you there? Yes, I'm there. Let me just uh, share the screen. Okay. One minute. Um, can you see that? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, so, my name is Dr. Maureen Mutua, uh, obstetrician and gynecology at the University of Nairobi Health Services. And today I'm going to present a case of a critical COVID disease in twin pregnancy. Uh, so just before I go on, um, I want to declare that I have no conflict of interest. And uh, I just want to pre present this patient. Uh, for patient uh, I was part of a team that managed this patient at the, at the Khan University Hospital um, and so that we can learn from it as, as I did when I was managing her. So basically, I'm going to present a patient called MOT who was admitted at the, at the Khan University Hospital with a diagnosis of critical COVID-19 infection in pregnancy. Uh, on her history, she basically was a 36-year-old RA6 plus 2 gravida 9 with a twin gestation of 28 weeks. Her last delivery was 2019, which was a normal delivery. And she came with a chief complaint of a persistent cough and uh, difficulty in breathing for six days. She came in as a referral <clears throat> with a diagnosis already made uh, five days prior uh, based, and with worsening of symptoms. She was initially on home-based care and had a brief admission at a peripheral clinic uh, before she finally was transferred to the Aga Khan Hospital. She, her antenatal clinic follow-up was uneventful and she gave no history of chronic illness like diabetes or hypertension. Uh, she had not received any COVID vaccine uh, vaccination, uh, either before pregnancy or during the pregnancy. 
So uh, at the time of admission, she was sick looking, very agitated patient. Her vital signs showed a blood pressure of 9256, a pulse rate of 121, and an SPO2 of uh, between, ranging between 84 to 88 on room air. And this improved when she was put, put on oxygen mask uh, to 94%. Uh, auscultation of the chest at admission showed mild by best of reputations, and uh, her fundal height was at 34 weeks. Uh, twin one, fetal heart rate was 122, and the twin two was 144. Initial investigations showed a white cell count uh, that was increased at 12.48, a low HB of 7.6, and a normal platelet count of 213. Her CRP was also elevated at 67 with a procalcitonin of 4.6. Her ECG showed a sinus tachycardia uh, with a borderline prolonged QT interval. So at admission, she was put under care of a physician and the obstetrician, which was myself, and she was started on IV antibiotics, ceftriaxone and azithromycin. She was put on vitamin C or foralin inhaler. She was put on um, prophylactic dose of um, Subcute plexin at 40 milligrams OD, IV dexamethasone, IV nexium, uh, paracetamol, IV venofa, and ascorin. So the patient was then transferred to the isolation ward, but during her stay there, she was noted to have increased oxygen demand, and this was increased from the initial 2.5 to 8 liters and uh, to maintain an SpO2 of 94% on a non-rebreather mask. And this also had to be gradually increased to 10 liters. Uh, the, uh, she had a lab which showed an increase of the increased inflammatory marker CRP from 67 to 92. And also during her stay there, she had a CT scan, which was done that showed uh, she had 40 to 50% lung involvement, but there was no evidence of a pulmonary embolus. Uh, a decision was made to transfer her to the critical care unit, basically under a multidisciplinary team which consisted of an intensivist, an infectious disease team, a physician and obstetrician. She was transfused to units of PAC cells, um, PAC cells are diseased because of her low HB and her dose of uh, clexin was increased from 40 to 60 milligrams twice a day because uh, to 12, for uh, for therapeutic dose. On day two, the patient was noted not to be getting better. Basically, her respiratory rate was between 23 to 27. Her temperature was 36. Um, <clears throat> she was, uh, the fetal heart rates were normal for both twins, but she noted to be having increased oxygen requirements. She was now on a high flow nasal cannula at 100% of fraction, of, uh, fraction of inspired oxygen of uh, 60 liters at 100%, but she was still desaturating at 86%. Also of note was the increasing inflammatory markers. It was now at 132 from 92. And also the procalcitonin was also increasing from 14.74 4, from, uh, 4, from 4.6 at admission. So we had a family conference with the infectious disease team and the family, and they consented, consented to the use of tocilizabam despite its limited use in pregnancy. Also at this time, we made a decision to transition the patient to a non-invasive mask <coughs> uh, for the oxygen delivery. So on day three, the CRP was still increasing. Now it was at 175. The SPO2 was at 87. She was still on a non rebreather mask at 15 liters. Her pulse uh, respiratory rate was 27 to 40. The, the fetal heart rates remained normal. But uh, one thing about this patient was that she was not uh, compliant with the NIV mask because um, she felt like it was bulky and she was getting claustrophobic. So there was this um, alternating between a non rebreather mask and an NIV mask. When she put on the non rebreather mass, we could get um, saturations of up to 92%. And at this time, uh, we were consulted uh, to consider delivery of the patient. Of course, we, as a obstetrician, we prefer to deliver her at 34 weeks or with an estimated fetal weight of 2,000 grams, or if the patient condition continued to deteriorate. 
So on day, on day four, which was two days after receiving the tocilizabam, uh, we actually had a turnaround. The SPO2 went to 97% on an NIV mask, and uh, which was being delivered at an <clears throat> Uh, at, at a fraction of inspired oxygen of 100%, and her um, respiratory rate was at about 30. The significant thing was the reducing inflammatory markers, which now actually dipped from uh, 175 to 86. So day five, three days after receiving the tocilizabam, the patient was noted to become though poorly feeding, the SPO2 now was between 92 to 93 on non rebreather mask. Uh, she kept on alternating between the in a non rebreather mask and the NIV. The respiratory rate was at 26. The fetal heart rates remained normal. The CRP now had come down to 31. On day seven, she was... Uh, she was having an SPO2 of 96 on NIV and her respiratory rate was at 27 uh, respiratory rates per minute. The patient was also started on parental nutrition. However, on day eight, we noted a dip of the SPO2 to about 89% and her respiratory rate started to, was still ranging between 28 to 32. The fetal heart rates remained normal and now there started to be a change in the inflammatory markers. The CRP started rising slowly at 43, and the procalcitonin also were creeping up, suggesting that there could have been a secondary infection other than the, other than the COVID. And she actually was diagnosed to have a left upper limb from phlebitis. Uh, vancomycin was added to an um, antibiotic regime and also blood cultures were taken. On day nine, her oxygen requirements seemed to be climbing back up at between 87 to 93 on NIV. And her CRP also was rising again at 58, for, uh, was rising from 58, I think this was from 47. The procalcitonin after we started the vancomycin went down. Her WBC was now at 14.18 and HB was 10 after the transfusion. Uh, the intensivist had, um, actually raised a red flag to, the, to ask the obstetrician uh, because of uh, increasing oxygen requirements and basic tachypnea and deterioration to consider delivery of the patient. Of course, there were other risks which were inherent uh, of, for PPH, postpartum hemorrhage. The patient was a grand multipar she had grand multiparity at parasites and she was on therapeutic doses of Clexen, uh, of course, with a teen gestation and over distension of the uterus. So we had a family conference with the relatives and the anesthetic team, and they gave us consent to, to go ahead with the delivery because of the patient's condition. So the cesarean delivery was undertaken 24 hours later to win off the Clexen, uh, which was done under anesthesia. And the twin one was delivered cephalic at 1490 grams. Twin two was delivered also cephalic at 1450 grams. Estimated blood loss was about 800 ml. She had been given a bolus of magnesium sulfate for gram. This was one hour before delivery. And uh, the, prima, the premature twins were taken to the neonatal ICU while the mother was transferred back to, to ICU. However, her post-op was very stormy. We noted that when she was in ICU, she had a worsening of the respiratory function. She had a respiratory acidosis. Her respiratory rate shot up to 45 to 50 on NIV. And uh, her blood gases showed a pH of 7.08 and a PCO2 of 102 and a P oxygen of uh, 51. So a decision was made to intubate her. Day two post-op, the condition actually uh, got worse. She was now desaturating at 68%. And um, a chest X-ray was done as an emergency to rule out a pneumothorax. There was no pneumothorax, but it showed a progressive worsening of the ground glass opacities. Also, an echo was done <clears throat> at that time, and it showed a hyperdynamic left ventricle, and uh, the right ventricle and atrium were, non were noted to be enlarged. 
Unfortunately, the patient's condition continued to deteriorate and she later succumbed on the same day after a failed 10 cycle CPR. So <clears throat> the silver lining on this very dark cloud was that both twins, when they were are transferred to the neonatal ICU, tested negative for COVID as SARS infection, and they were managed by the neonatologist and later discharged home after they both gained weight to 2,000 grams each. So I just go to uh, discussion. I just highlight a few issues uh, as we were managing this patient. And this uh, discussion, I think, will be picked up by the other panelists. I'll just highlight a few issues when I was, we were managing this patient. So pregnant women may be at an increased risk of severe illness for COVID-19, particularly in the third trimester. The overall risk of death still remains low, I think at less than 2%. And the Delta variant seems to be associated with more severe disease. Vertical transmission seems to be rare, even as we saw in this uh, patient, despite uh, critical illness. And the preterm birth rate is higher and mainly due to iatrogenic reason. We seem to deliver this mother because of deteriorating maternal condition. So in terms of uh, severity, basically the WHO classification of severe disease, for patients who, like this patient who already came with confirmed um, COVID, I think they are triaged either to non-severe, severe or critical uh, COVID. For the non-severe, basically it shows this absence of signs of severe or critical disease. Those who fall to severe have an SpO2 of less than 90% on room air with a respiratory rate at 30 of, of more than 30 in adults and signs of severe respiratory distress. While those uh, now who need uh, support, ventilatory support now are classified as critical. So my patient was actually admitted as uh, severe. She had an SpO2 of between 84 to 86 on admission on room air, but she later progressed to critical, critical, the critical COVID disease and had to be admitted to the critical care unit. Um, so patient factors for this my patient, she was 36 years. So maternal age seems to play a factor, those who are older than 35 years, those who have pre-pregnancy comorbids like diabetes or hypertension or a BMI of above 25, frontline uh, healthcare workers or other people who actually face a lot of crowds seem to be also more at risk among many other factors. So very quickly, uh, in terms of timing of delivery, for these patients when they're admitted, I think they're either classified as critical or based on clinical um, evidence, they can be classified as we've seen on either non-severe to severe or critical. And if they are classified as a critical, then they have to be admitted into the ICU and uh, the regime um, management is uh, dexamethasone, as, as we had seen in, in her management. We give her dexamethasone, uh, low molecular weight, uh, heparin, and um, other drugs that are approved. In this case, we gave her, uh, after a family conference, we gave her to Silizabam because, uh, of course, it was limited data and using pregnancy. So, in terms of timing of delivery, of course, gestation matters. Uh, there are those who uh, have pre-viable gestation and uh, depending on whether they improve or not, for those who are pre-viable, sometimes perimortem um, cesarean de uh, delivery is done for those who are greater than 20 weeks. My patient was between 28 to 31 weeks. She was basically in this second group, uh, this second group. And in this one, basically, we deliver or based on deteriorating maternal condition. And if we can push them to 31 weeks, uh, that would be great. And then 32 weeks, actually, that would be great and then deliver them. For those who come between 32 to 34 weeks, um, they, and they're in critical illness, the idea would be to give them the steroids and deliver. While for those who are over, that four weeks is depends on their condition. I think you may have to expedite delivery if they, they go into critical illness. 
So moving forward, use of antibiotics, of course, clinical suspicion, they come with pneumonias, basically an early review with rational use of antibiotics. And even for coexisting conditions, they must be treated. Like for example, my patient uh, developed uh, thrombophlebitis. The procalcitonin actually started to rise uh, during her stay and it pointed that there was another infection other than the COVID. And so we're able to pick it up. Steroid use, of course, it's recommended on admission or until for 10 days or up to discharge. And also for those patients who require oxygen supplementation or ventilatory support, and for those who have a prematurity or fetal lung maturity, it should be used. So there's also a role for low molecular weight um, uh, heparin, which is given as from a prophylaxis, unless there's a contraindication, and if there's suspicion, of course, of uh, venous thromboembolism. Usually, of course, the contraindication is if the platelet count is less than 50 than 50,000. Uh, use of uh, uh, interleukin-6 receptor antagonist or tocilizabam. It's been, it's been shown to improve survival in patients with an SP of less than 92 or a C-reactive protein of above 75 uh, milligrams per liter. Limited data on use in pregnancy. So of course, uh, when we use these uh, uh, drugs, we should involve the family and they should be quite aware about the limited data and, and the fact that if it's a turning point in helping the patient. For my patient, I think it, it, it when we gave it to her, she improved. But um, unfortunately, after, uh, uh, I think the, after when she, initially when we gave it, she improved and then she deteriorated. And so, so we had to, to deliver her. Thank you. So that is my presentation. And um, just before I, I switch off, I would want to actually, uh, these are some of the <clears throat> differences where I got my information. And I would also like to acknowledge the Aga Khan University Hospital and the multidisciplinary team that I was part of in taking care of this patient. Thank you for listening to me. That's uh, the end of the presentation. So yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Maureen, for an excellent presentation. We are sad that you lost this patient, but we can see how much effort uh, went into really managing this patient in the best way possible. And uh, I guess we pray for the little babies that they will be well. So thank you so much. There are a few questions here that you might just want to handle before we move on to Dr. Kihara's talk. So um, someone asks, why did this patient end up with a cesarean section? At that gestation, would there have been the possibility of induction of labor? Um, was the patient too sick? So I guess even just uh, a little around the issues that determine choice of delivery method. Yes, the patient, um, of course, uh, in, in, in determining the choice of uh, delivery, it's either uh, we do an induction uh, or induction of labor, but she's a patient who was uh, very sick and um, Delivery was actually done <clears throat> actually because of maternal condition and we had to do it the fastest way we could. She had a twin gestation, both were cephalic. And of course, in situations where the mother was not sick, that would have been, uh, that would maybe have been considered. But in this case, uh, we didn't have time. We just didn't have time to do induction and wait for labor and then deliver her because the delivery was actually uh, to save the mother. Um, thank you very much for that presentation. I think uh, people can continue to post their questions and we'll answer them at the end. But for now, allow me to invite Dr. Ann Kihara. Dr. Ann Kihara has been a teacher for a long time, uh, an obstetrician par excellence at the University of Nairobi. Dr. Kihara, Karibu Sana. Dr. Maureen, you can take down your presentation to allow Dr. Kihara to share hers. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doc. Sorry. You can click on the stop share. Dr. Kihara, Karibu. Yes. 
I hope you can see my screen. Yes, we can. Is it on slideshow or not yet? Good. No, good, it's morning, every, good morning, everybody. I must acknowledge that this is a presentation we have done, um, not myself alone, but together with Dr. Rose Koske, who's also a colleague of mine. We do not have any conflict of interest, but please take note of the darkness around this slide. COVID has disrupted our lives, but we have to deal with it. It's our new norm and we have to really wake up to what it's presenting to us socially, medically, and even in the knowledge base that we really need to all seek. So this will be our outline. We'll give a small introduction. Then I will specifically look at pregnancy and through the continuum of care from preconception to conception to pregnancy, and then probably outline principles of management in pregnancy and give a summary of the same. We all know about COVID. It is an acute respiratory syndrome um, with a virus, and it actually came into vogue in December of 2019 in Kenya in March 2020. But let's pay attention. What is it and how does it affect pregnant women? In pregnant women, the physiological changes in the altered immune system increases her risk to morbidity and mortality. And this physiology in and of itself even predisposes her more to infections such as pneumonia. Unfortunately, COVID-19 can also mimic other diseases, which I will allude to, which are medical or obstetric in nature. But pregnancy in and of itself is a risk factor for poorer outcomes. And particularly from the case Maureen has presented when it does happen in the third trimester. So how do people present? You can have a cough, fever, myalgia, headache, dyspnea, sore throat, diarrhea. There can be nausea and vomiting, absence of smell, rhinorrhea, chills, rigors, fatigue, confusion, chest pain, or pressure. In other words, the symptom sequelae with COVID can be definitive or vague. So we just need to be alert that it is possible. Specimen collection. We know about the oral pharyngeal swabs, all of us, nasopharyngeal swabbing. In the lower respiratory tract, we have tracheal aspiration, bronchoalveolar lavage, pleural fluid that can be collected, lung biopsy. We also can use stool specimen, blood specimen, and we have increasing research areas happening in the placenta the umbilical cord and amniotic fluid, principally to check, are we having risk of vertical transmission? And we do know we subject this to PCR testing. What do we do if you do have a COVID positive patient? And I think Maureen's case has really brought out the test that we need to do. But principally, you're looking at what can increase the inflammatory condition secondary to COVID? What can increase the thrombotic phenomenon associated with COVID? And of course, the chest X-ray. So a raised C-reactive protein, lymphopenia, leukocytosis, which would point to infections, procalcitonin levels, abnormal liver function tests, and the thrombotic issues. On chest X-ray, you will all ask, chest X-ray, are you supposed to do it in pregnancy? But it is clear you would want to do a shielded chest X-ray. And number two, the propagation of radiation to the fetus is minimum. And this also goes with the CT scans and the CT angiograms that are done. But I've listed there for you what you expect to see. Ground glass opacities, posterior lung involvement like it was in Maureen's case, Multiloba involvement, bilateral lung involvement, peripheral distribution or consolidation are some of the things you would expect to find on the chest. Now let's move to preconception. And this is a common question ladies are now asking us. What can I do with COVID-19 pandemic? And yet I want to get pregnant. So this brings us to why it's important, even as we are addressing the package we normally have for our women 
during preconception. We discuss all these topics or ought to do so. Nutrition, genetic conditions, environmental health, infertility and subfertility, FGM if it has happened, pregnancies happening too soon, too early, too often, too many, STIs including HIV, gender-based violence and more so intimate partner violence, mental health and the psychosocial environment for women who are planning to get pregnant and the use of substance and um, drug abuse. But I must mention increasingly in the preconceptual period, we'll begin to also discuss vaccinations. I'll put some in mind. We are already giving vaccines for influenza. We are already giving vaccines for whooping cough. And we are saying we also need to begin to introduce vaccination for COVID-19. So beyond giving the vaccination, what else should we be discussing nowadays with women and her family, because she's not alone, is the universal precautions, hand washing, masking, social distancing. Those are the mitigation measures we all are familiar with now. And the reason we want to really emphasize preconceptual care is you want to optimize the incubator, who's the mother, for a planned pregnancy. Conduct risk assessments and uh, pay attention to biomedical, behavioral, and social interventions. Contraception, when do I stop it so that I can conceive? And am I having issues even with that choice I had made on contraception? Maximize the nutritional environment, knowing not only is she taking care of her own body, she needs to feed another individual. So the macronutrients and the micronutrient environment is crucial, and particularly introduction of folic acid, because we do know neonatal or in utero embryogenesis, or when the organs of the baby are forming, Without folic acid, there are risks of congenital abnormalities. Optimize control and management of other comorbidities, such as diabetes, hypertension, HIV, if it's existent, social and mental health issues, and screening for cancers, particularly in our setup, cervical cancer and breast cancer. So we move on. I'm desirous of fertility. Is COVID affecting the sperm? Is COVID affecting the ova? So far, there are no pointers that actually say we have increased teratogenicity coming from this. But a lot of people are saying, should I really get pregnant or should I wait? Ladies and gentlemen, COVID is here to stay. We're already seeing variation in the variants. So we need to deal with it as it comes, but also be cognizant to be wary of what it can do and cannot do. And this is basically what we know so far. Pregnancy-related risks associated with COVID-19 are not higher than that related to other conditions or exposures amongst uh, pregnant people without COVID. The risk can really be minimized and mitigated if we are also observing standard precautions and vaccinating. And currently, the available vaccines are not thought to affect fertility. Pregnancy testing is not a requirement prior to receiving any approved vaccination. And if anything, we're using that platform to gain the knowledge we're gaining for those who actually find out they're pregnant yet were vaccinated. And it's therefore not necessary to delay pregnancy even after you've been vaccinated. So we'll now move to it in pregnancy. What is happening? Pregnancy does not increase susceptibility to COVID-19. However, complications of the clinical course can be worse off. And this has typically been epitomized by what Maureen presented. Symptomatic pregnant patients appear to be at increased risk of severe disease and death compared with the symptomatic non-pregnant patient. And as Maureen said, there are risk factors that we actually are beginning to see that compound the severity or the critical nature of the disease. And this includes 
the age above 35, what you would call the elderly mom, obesity, pre-existing medical comorbidities such as hypertension and diabetes, as just a few to mention. What is data showing us? We looked at some systematic reviews and just tabulated what are they finding as issues. The presence of pneumonia, and you can see this study studied over 64,000 pregnant women suspected or confirmed with COVID. That's a huge number. So pneumonia is very common. Use of oxygen by cannula. And I really want us to flag the oxygen cascade in pregnancy. That in and of itself tells you the magnanimity of the problem with COVID-19. Acute respiratory distress syndrome reported in 13%. Severe disease in 11%. Those getting admitted into ICU, 3%. Those who received invasive ventilation, 2%. Extracorporeal membrane oxygenation was minimum, 0.1%. And death, unfortunately, in 1%. So we need to recognize, even as practitioners, respiratory disorders, including secondary pneumonic processes, respiratory failure, and acute respiratory distress syndrome are things we must be having at the back of our mind. Cardiac disorders, and it's good, Maureen's case, she actually did the ECGs. Thromboembolic complications. These are sedentary people, and the more critical you are, hypostatic pneumonias, and VTEs, even pulmonary embolism can occur. Secondary infections, acute kidney failure, neurological disorders, gastrointestinal and liver disorders, psychiatric illness. Now let's swing the boat a bit because she's carrying a baby. And the question is, how much is propagating as COVID to the fetus? And this is what we are finding from the research that's going on. Frequency remains unclear, and we have few documented cases of congenital infections. There are a few. The diagnosis is by the PCR testing in umbilical cord blood, or you take neonatal blood within the first 12 hours of birth. You can also look at amniotic fluid collected prior to the rupture of membranes. Most placental studies so far have shown changes in fact, some have reported changes on the trophoblastic tissue, evidence that COVID has actually um, diffused into the placenta. But the virus eventually has only been seen to cross to the fetus in very few cases. So there is the issue. Then when does the baby get to test positive? We are finding in the immediate postpartum transmission, this can occur through questionably, breast milk, and also from the infected mother or caregiver to the infant. How does that happen? Aerosol transmission of the disease. So what are some of the pregnancy outcomes or the increase? Only we, as the obstetricians and midwives, need to intervene much earlier, and therefore it's principally iatrogenic. Preeclampsia, increased risk. Outcome by severity of maternal disease. So adverse pregnancy outcome is increased in symptomatic patients, particularly with severe and critical disease. You've all heard Maureen's story. What are for the baby? Congenital anomalies, these are not increased. Still births, no different from the general population. Newborn outcomes, over 90% in good condition at birth, mostly asymptomatic. Few may develop mild symptoms, but mortality and morbidity is principally as a secondary aftermath by virtue that we are prematurely delivering our mothers. So what then becomes principles of management? Because I think this is really critical. And I will start by saying this. You need to get a symptomatic score. Is the mother symptomatic or asymptomatic? If she is symptomatic, is it mild disease 
moderate disease, severe or critical. And we will allude what are the pointers for this. One, does your patient need to be on oxygen? And what is the delivery mode to keep the oxygenation above 94%? Are you using nasal prongs? Are you using a mask? Are you using the NRM? Are you using the NIV? Or do you even have to go to the extent of intubating or providing extracorporeal methods? Why am I saying this? That in and of itself is a pointer that something is amiss and this is a very sick patient. There is the use of antiretroviral therapy. Remdesivir is what is actually currently through this particular trial, recovery trial, being advocated for now. But we also have the role of steroids. We have the role of anti-inflammatory drugs like tocilizumab, which was used in this. There are people who are beginning to use targeted drugs to actually address the spike protein on the coronavirus. But the question is, and we need to reflect every time we give medications in pregnancy, one, fetal teratogenicity. Number two is addressed to the gestational age of the mother and how is the fetus faring in that environment. And finally, make decisions on timing of delivery and all of us need to know it must be individualized. And we have one opportunity here with COVID. I cannot work alone. I must work with a keen team approach as mandatory. So asymptomatic patient, you keep assessing risk assessment. Are they developing severe disease? Oxygenation is your major pointer. Close monitoring for respiratory decompensation. And if it is occurring, you must be in a hospital and not a peripheral one, but a tertiary hospital. Infection control and self-isolation, if you're asymptomatic, minimally 14 days. If you are a symptomatic patient, categorize the severity. You must have a multidisciplinary team and your clinical care should even address underlying medical and obstetric issues that may arise. But most of all, what we ignore most is there is a social situation. All of us know COVID patients and have managed COVID patients. And you know what it means to the family in terms of the psychosocial stigma still around COVID. So in, in principle, you have to make up your mind are you on home-based care for mild cases or are you having hospital care for moderate to severe cases? Antenatally, when mothers are pregnant, we know we are limiting the number of visitations she's making and having more of a self-driven, self-care, self-advocacy and telemedicine consults. But in suspected cases, you must test and you must employ use of PPE. We must protect ourselves and also protect the family because of the public health mitigation measures we put in place. For sick patients with comorbidities, please admit, triage, have precautionary measures, isolate and institute management. Decisions will be based on the symptoms, risk factors and results of the index pregnant patient assessment. It may be a busy slide, but I think this is a really beautiful slide um, which I wish we could all adopt. And I will only say three things to this slide. Symptom scoring. How is this patient behaving? Are you having comorbidities? If the symptoms are extensive, if the patient requires oxygen support, if the patient has comorbidities, admit. If the patient doesn't have excessive symptoms, mild symptoms, you can monitor this patient, but they must be told about the warning signs. And what do I mean? I would want us all to focus at the bottom of this slide. What gives me pointers? This is a critically ill patient. We have the meow chat, the red alert. If the breath sound, the respiratory rate is less than 10 or more than 30 per minute. 
if the oxygenation is below 94%, if the temperatures are hypothermic, less than 35 or above 38, if the systolic blood pressure is greater than 180 or less than 90, if the diastolic is greater than 100, if the heart rate is too low, less than 40, or too high, over 120, that's a patient who must be with you in a tertiary facility and nursed as a critical patient. So we need to really refocus again. Our vital signs are a mainstay. Intrapartum, when a woman comes to deliver, again, assess your patient, risk assessment, triage the patient, know if there are comorbidities, what is the gestational age, how is the fetal status. COVID in and of itself does not say deliver. It is a compounding situation on the mother that actually makes you deliver her. Again, multidisciplinary approach. But I have put a sentence at the bottom there. You must reduce aerosol spread of the virus. And this can happen, one, with lack of pain management. So the woman is actually having labored breathing and trying to also address pain. She's COVID positive. So there's aerosol propagation of that disease. Second stage, with bearing down, there'll be propagation of that disease. Anesthetic intubation and extubation increases the aerosol risk. And this is why we are propagating for COVID patients who need a cesarean section, regional anesthesia is the way to go. Now let's relate it to gestation. Pre-viable and viable fetus. Maureen had alluded to it, so I'll just touch on it briefly. Less than 28 weeks, and the woman is able to maintain ventilation and oxygenation. We can give expectant management, but be cognizant that there could still be a risk of prematurity or intrauterine fetal death, because without supportive oxygen or supplemental oxygen, the baby will be hypoxic. If she's less than 28 weeks and cannot sustain ventilation, you may have to consider delivery to improve the mother's ventilatory status. If she's more than 28 weeks, the question would then be deliver or wait. Please remember, we have lung immaturity if you deliver a very, very premature baby. But if there are signs of non-reassuring fetal status, then you may have to consider. But in a woman where the gestation is more than 28 weeks and she cannot possibly maintain ventilation, consider delivery. So it becomes the mother takes the front seat because she needs to be given optimal um, opportunity to survive. Now, somebody even asked in the chat, why did you give magnesium sulfate? We're not treating convulsions here for hypertensive disorder. But in premature babies, less than 34 weeks, you want to give neuroprotection. And the drug of choice is magnesium sulfate. But it is administered over one hour to actually limit the side effect of magnesium sulfate, which could be respiratory depression. So I hope we've answered that one. So we've delivered the mother. We come into the postpartum period. What are some of the immediate things we have to think about? One, as Maureen said in her case, she had to be cognizant. This is a lady who's critically ill, has the risk of thromboembolic um, phenomenon. If you have comorbidities, you still have to stabilize the hypertensive disease and the diabetes. But the first and immediate thing is, what do I do when I'm clamping the cord? Dissociating the mother from the baby. So we are having studies that are still underway to check for vertical transmission. It has been seen in a few cases, but we're saying do not delay cord clamping as we still continue trying to unravel. Is there a benefit with the delayed cord clamping that we have begun to advocate so that we reduce neonatal anemia? Skin to skin contact, like you can see the lady in the picture below, kangaroo mother care. All we are saying, observe infection precaution measures. Most babies who are known to acquire COVID-19 is through aerosol. So mask, hand hygiene. 
But we also know hypothermia kills newborns. So we need to do, we have to take care. Breastfeeding, it is avoided in critically ill patients. And the, there is a question as to whether the virus is spread in also breast milk, but more oftenly it is the aerosol. So observe precautionary measures. Psychosocial well-being crucial in the continuum of care. So we are looking at a sick mother. We are looking at a baby who may come out well, but may develop illness secondary. We need to be cautious. And I have clearly stated the extended family. Thank you, Maureen and your people for giving constant debriefs of the patient, constant debriefs. So they're involved with what is happening as far as management is concerned. So I just put a few slides here to just remind us, even before COVID came, really, we had precautionary measures. So we're not inventing the wheel. We had shoe covers. We had water impermeable gowns or aprons that we wear when we are delivering women. We have hats, we have masks, we have eye protection, we wear sterile gloves. So it's not nothing new, but this is what is important. The aerosol generating me medical procedures. I thought this is really important for all of us to know how can you propagate it? And you can clearly see endotracheal intubation and especially with cardiopulmonary resuscitation is one of the major ways you can propagate it. The rest I will leave you to actually read through. But we also have areas that we are saying that are not aerosol propagating procedures. Coughing and expectorated sputum, oral suctioning, cesarean section of vaginal delivery with regional anesthesia. It is safer than oxygen delivered at less or equal to six liters per minute by nasal prongs and less than equal to 15 liters per minute by venturi masks and non-breather masks. So we can see there's some procedural things you need to be aware of that will actually increase the risk of COVID spread. All of us need to remember the donning and all of us need to remember the doffing because we must know these procedures to be able to say, I'm actually reducing the spread. So my final area will come to prevention. Are we able to prevent COVID-19 in the continuum of care of women? So pregnant persons should follow recommendations as non-pregnant people using universal precautionary measures and public health mitigation measures. It's been noted, pregnant mothers with children in households should exercise caution. Much as we do know the young child under 10 years often will get a mild and be asymptomatic, although very minimal severe cases have been reported. Essentially, they tend to be safe. We must use as health providers appropriate PPEs in our workplace, but there is room for vaccination. Vaccination as a major preventive arm. And I'll put a paper here where we've talked about vaccination amongst pregnant and breastfeeding people. Unfortunately, we cannot do RCTs, but we definitely can observe with, with that populace, how are they behaving? So CDC data so far has over 139,000 participants who actually indicated they were pregnant by the time they got the vaccination. And what did it actually show? There were no obvious safety signals with respect to miscarriage, congenital anomalies, fetal growth, preterm births, stillbirths, or neonatal deaths. So essentially what are we saying? It seems to be safe to be administered in pregnancy and does not increase the risk for those um, pregnancy-related adverse outcomes. That is indicating that it can therefore be given from preconception to pregnancy and into the postpartum period. And this is one of the recommendations which we have picked from RCOG that says, COVID-19 vaccination is recommended for all people 12 years and older, those who are pregnant, those who are breastfeeding, those who are trying to get pregnant now or may be pregnant in the near future. So in summary, I will end by saying, let's put precaution and prevention right at the top because it is worth a million dollars vis-a-vis curing. 
the clinical course presentation, we need to have the symptom scoring, the clinical scoring, the lab scoring, and eventually make a decision based on how is the mother with the disease, are there comorbidities, what is the gestation, and what will be the eventual outcome for both mother and baby. And with management, always take on a multidisciplinary team approach. We are bound to win this battle. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kihara, for a fantastic presentation. Um, I think you've highlighted uh, very crucial areas. You've highlighted very crucial areas in the management of pregnant women, and it comes at such an, a good time because over the last several months, we have noticed increasing number of pregnant women presenting, increasing number of pregnant women with very severe outcomes. So the pointers were so practical and they're things that we really can pick up and work with. So thank you so much. That was a fantastic presentation. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Kihara. Thank you, Dr. Koske, uh, for this excellent work. So maybe just a few questions, even as we prepare to just hear something small on vaccination in pregnant women and around the times of pregnancy. So uh, one of the questions that has come up is around issues of diabetes. For us uh, doing adult medicine, we've seen a lot of patients come in with newly diagnosed diabetes, a lot of patients having very difficult to control uh, hyperglycemia in spite of use of insulin, often requiring very high doses of insulin. And I wonder what your experience with management of diabetes in pregnancy has been. Can I comment? Yes, please. Okay. Um, pregnancy in and of itself, we know, is a diabetogenic state. Now, here you have a lady who's compounded now with an infection that really throws and catapults her because we do know even the propensity to now go into DKA and even worse, glycemic control actually happens in the pregnant state. So, yes. In and of itself, as pregnant women, because of the hormonal environment, I have a risk of being a diabetic or developing diabetes. And then that's aggravated now with additional infections. So the insulin requirement definitely will cascade much, much higher. Unfortunately, the worse off the patient is, even the risk of DKA, coma, and even death is something that if we don't check, can actually take our patients. Um, thank you so much. I think one of the concerns that has been brought up even in previous webinars was the issue of deterioration after delivery. I think mm -hmm. one of the things that has always been highlighted is, you know, if you have a pregnant woman who's deteriorating, you really mm -hmm. want to save that woman. Delaying is not going to save that woman. But a number of people have noted that sometimes once they intervene and deliver, then they then begin to see rapid deterioration. And maybe just issues around what could be some of the causes and how can we reduce that and improve outcomes even post-delivery. Okay, now we have what I would call the, it's kind of similar to Iris, the, the cytokine storm. So you have the cytokine storm that's happening. So this is where you're producing interleukin-1, interleukin-6, interleukin-10, and human necrotizing factors as a result of the COVID infection. Now, post-delivery, you have a, a body that is also trying to repair itself post having carried a pregnancy. So one, the hormonal environment. Two, the change in physiology that's happening. Three, the added risk of infections. Four, we need to also be cognizant with all these manipulations that are happening. If you're in, in intubating a woman, if you're constantly doing um, recurrent vaginal um, examinations, if you're not using aseptic procedural issues or paying attention to that, in fact, a lot more people are now saying, should we just prophylactically treat these women with antibiotics? Because there is still yet the added risk of more severe infections, secondary or secondary to COVID infection. So we tend to see postoperatively, women tend to have a resurgence or a flare up of infection areas. One, I have loquia loss. Blood in and of itself is a media for infection. 
I am hypostatic. Pneumonias is a risk for infections. I may be having a urinary catheter, and we need to remember to keep changing that catheter. Yes, because that in and of itself has even a propensity to aggravate infections. I have breasts and breast milk is being produced, a very good culture again for infections. So this is where infection precautions, and this is the reason why I even added those slides. We really need to keep that at the back of our minds. Avoid, avoid, avoid having septic kind of related procedures done. Be aseptic, isolate this lady. In fact, we talk of using the negative um, rooms, negative pressured rooms, but do we have them? Let's work with what we have. I think that's an excellent place to stop. I, one of the questions someone had asked was the issue of antibiotic use. And this is someone, something that we've tried to deal with in several uh, webinars in the past. And mm -hmm. I think that issue of infection prevention is key. We cannot yeah. afford to start every patient pregnant or not on antibiotics because one of the observations we've had is a very steep increase in amount of antimicrobial resistance that we're seeing uh, from COVID yeah. units. And this is just related to the amount of unnecessary antibiotic use. So we yeah. must prevent infections so that we do not have to treat them. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kihara. That was fantastic. Uh, allow me now to invite uh, Professor Nzala, who will give some brief comments on vaccination in pregnancy. Professor Nzala? Yes, yes, Louis, you, you can hear me? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Yeah, yeah thank you, thank you, colleagues. This is uh, uh, very interesting. Indeed, uh, as the previous speakers have said, COVID has uh, thrown spanners into the works of healthcare. And uh, as we are all learning, uh, all is not known. Now, uh, for all the clinical trials that we have actually conducted here at CAVI, uh, pregnancy is always an exclusion criteria. And most often than not, we work very, very hard to ensure that uh, the volunteers who come in are actually on proper contraceptives that during screening and more so during vaccination and during follow-up that they don't get pregnant at all. Because when they do, uh, then they are moved to another category where we have to follow the mother till delivery and where we have to follow the mother and the child for any adverse events for five years. So really it is a real critical issue. And uh, as literature shows and as science is moving, vaccines are not usually advised in pregnancy, you know, for obvious reasons. And really the vaccines that one must stay away from during pregnancy are really live vaccines. The BCGs, the MMR, the oral uh, typhoid, the oral polio, yellow fever. These vaccines are completely a no-no in uh, during pregnancy. However, there are vaccines that can be considered during pregnancy. Influenza, so long as it is not live attenuated, influenza vaccine is recommended uh, in pregnancy. And indeed, really, uh, from what we have seen, uh, I don't know whether it is policy in this country, but we should be administering influenza vaccine in pregnancy. Hepatitis B, hepatitis A, both uh, meningococcal and pneumococcal polysaccharides, tetanus, these vaccines can be done. And as you can see, these are peptide and recombinants. They are really not uh, life attenuated. And maybe just to allude to a little point that uh, uh, the previous speaker has actually said, there's very little transmission of HIV through the placental barrier. And this is also occasioned because the window of viremia in, uh, in COVID <clears throat> is very, very brief. In fact, we hardly ever see uh, a SARS-CoV-2 virus in, uh, in the peripheral circulation. Although we are, we are seeing it in urine, we are also seeing a SARS-CoV-2 in stool, but the window period within which it's found in the peripheral circulation is actually very, very little. Now, to get to the point, 
<clears throat> really uh, vaccinations in pregnancy. Uh, what I did yesterday, I looked around and interesting enough, <clears throat> uh, there is a, there, there's this very quick rapid review that has, is actually still in press that is actually looking at uh, COVID vaccines for use in pregnancy. And this review was looking at safety components, the various components of the vaccine and the various platforms. As you are aware, gentlemen, we have various platforms and we also have various companies. So what these colleagues did is that they went into literature <clears throat> and selected and extracted data uh, to look at uh, uh, really what is going on. And in this particular review, uh, they retrieved uh, 6,757 uh, various aspects of uh, uh, clinic, uh, clinical either randomized or non-randomized. They also looked at 12 COVID-19 uh, pregnancy uh, registries. And at this point, then I begin to ask myself, Lois, maybe Mary Beth and the others can ask, do we have any data in this country of how many of our pregnant women have received uh, AstraZeneca, either one dose or do, two dose? And if we don't have, is there a way we can actually begin to put that data together, coupled to that also look at anything they have reported in terms of untoward effects. So in this particular uh, uh, rapid review, uh, they had 38 clinical and non-clinical studies. It involved 2.4 million uh, pregnant persons, but interesting enough, enough, there were also animal studies. There were also animal studies, and they looked at 56 pregnant animals which is unusual because uh, at times these studies are done, at times these studies are actually not, not done. And uh, what they were also looking at is just the issue of non-medically attended adverse events. Uh, those who are medically attended, they also looked at serious adverse events, issues to do with death, uh, life-threatening hospitalization. They also looked at any at, uh, events that led to disability, or incapacity in the child. They also looked at any form of congenital anomalies, birth defects, and they also looked at adverse events of special interest. And this was mainly looking at vaccine-associated enhanced disease, the multi-systemic inflammatory disease in children uh, that has actually been uh, uh, been 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 uh, uh, been reported. So all this actually was done, and. Uh, uh, this paper can be sent around for us actually to, to look at it and critically review. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, what they are saying is that uh, the, the, there is need for additional studies, but from the data they have picked, there was actually no uh, any untoward events that would actually prevent us uh, from giving the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine uh, to pregnant women. If you just look at uh, some of the areas here, these are the various uh, 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 vaccines. They looked at the protein and subunit vaccines. They looked at ve vectored vaccines, and this is actually the, the Johnson & Johnson and also the AstraZeneca. They also looked at the, from literature, the nucleic acid, the mRNA. There is Moderna, there is Pfizer there. And also they were looking at the, the various components uh, and mainly looking at adjuvants, the various adjuvants that are used, especially in the protein and subunit vaccines because the vectored vaccines and the mRNA vaccines are usually not coupled with, uh, with, the, with adjuvants. And uh, they were looking at the completeness of the clinical, you know, the clinical trial and the processes that they actually went through. So data is beginning to emerge, and the data that is being, beginning to emerge is actually very, very good data, which clearly tells us that uh, this is their selection process, which is actually telling us that uh, the vaccines, the, the COVID vaccines, uh, to, to a large extent, are actually safe uh, in pregnancy. 
using the various platforms, using the, uh, the nucleic acid platform, looking at the, uh, the vectored platforms, and also looking at uh, the looking at the uh, the peptide platforms. And it is interesting to note here, ladies and gentlemen, in terms of vectored vaccines. Uh, let us be clear. There are recombinant replicating vectors, and there are also recombinant non-replicating vectors. So far, the, the Jensen and Jensen is non-replicating, the Oxford AstraZeneca is non-replicating, but on the horizon, uh, there are uh, uh, vaccines that are coming uh, that will be vectored and replicating. And that sets a totally different aspect. Those replicative vectors have ability to linger on for a longer period of time, and maybe have also ability maybe to even move into the peripheral circulation and ability maybe to cross the placental barrier. We don't know yet. So when you are looking at vector vaccines, I think one must be able to look at the difference of whether it is replicating or non-replicating. At the same time, when you look at uh, Moderna, uh, the nucleic acid vaccine, especially the mRNA, there is also an mRNA that is self-replicating, and there's also an mRNA that is also non-replicating. The mRNA from Moderna and the mRNA from Pfizer are actually non-replicating mRNAs. So this area is actually still growing. We need to know. So in conclusion, really, and uh, uh, because it's an area that is actually growing, uh, what the conclusions we are getting from this very rapid review which is one of the very nice reviews that have looked at this, is clearly telling us that uh, whatever is in currently being used, AstraZeneca, uh, Moderna, Pfizer, and J and J, to a large extent, uh, these vaccines are actually safe. And then the other recommendation is that uh, the the doctors responsible, the people giving, should be able to look at case by case basis, and those pregnant women who are at high risk uh, of infection uh, are actually recommended to actually get this vaccine. So I'll actually stop here and we shall circulate, uh, uh, we shall circulate this particular paper so that um, our colleagues can actually look at it critically and, uh, and uh, understand uh, really how uh, those conclusions were arrived at. It's very nicely done. Although there are some biases here and there, but nonetheless, uh, those biases can actually be explained. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Nzala, for really an excellent summary around vaccination and issues around pregnancy. And um, it's unfortunate that many of the patients you're seeing who are pregnant now have not been vaccinated. And a lot of it was tied around the fear and uncertainty. Um, around whether vaccines were safe or not, or, you know, all those questions. And recently I got a very interesting question. Someone said, I got a vaccine recently. Can I get pregnant now? You know, so there's still a number of questions that people have to navigate through and deal with. And one of the questions that's been asked, and you mentioned this, and maybe just to comment on it again, um, people keep asking what is safe. Everyone is calling us to ask for Johnson and Johnson. They think it might be better than uh, the mRNA vaccines. And just those concerns with pregnancy. I don't know if we could just make a, a comment around is any one vaccine actually better or safer than the other? Uh, so that even as our patients approach us, as people ask us these questions, people just can have a better answer to that. Yeah, th thank you, thank you, thank you, Lois. This is still a moving target. If you look at this particular table, you can actually see the various aspects, the, the data they collected and the amount they looked at. Two, first of all, when I look at the, the clinical, uh, uh, clinical trials in themselves in terms of efficacy, and when you look at some of the data that is also coming in uh, uh, through uh, the emergency use authorization and rollout to the, to the public. The, the truth of the matter, colleagues, is that out of the four, the four or the five vaccines under emergency use authorization, there's no vaccine that is better than the other. These vaccines are actually designed to prevent disease, and they are actually doing that. 
And now we are also learning that some of them to some extent also uh, uh, prevent transmission to other people. So for me, I will not sit here and say that we should pick and choose AstraZeneca, or Moderna, you know, Pfizer, slightly different platforms, but the end game is actually the same. To a large extent, a vaccine that is working 70 to 80% of the time in the real world is actually good enough. And what we are actually aiming at is to ensure that we get a large pool of individuals who are vaccinated heading towards a herd immunity so that the transmission from one person becomes actually very difficult. So as far as I'm concerned, any of these products are good. And if you look at Europe, you look at North America, uh, for example, in, uh, uh, in Germany, Germany have been giving, they were giving Pfizer as the first dose, AstraZeneca as the second dose, Moderna as the first dose, AstraZeneca as the second dose. So you can actually see that the whole issue of, again, when people are talking about mixing, mixing is not a new phenomenon. It is happening. But even us in the clinical trials that we have been doing here at CAVI, and I'll use Ebola as an example. When we were testing Ebola here in phase one and phase two, we had two vaccines. We had two recombinants. One of them was Adeno 26 recombinant, and the other one was a modified vaccine here, Ankara recombinant, MVA. And we were actually uh, asking ourselves, which is a better prime and which is a better booster? And we were looking at either giving AD26 first and MVA second, or giving MVA first and AD26 second. So what people are discussing now in terms of mixing was also not really uh, an issue. So these vaccines work. Majority of them in the real world are hovering around 70% effectiveness, which is actually good enough. And I'm sure somebody is also thinking about mixing. Mixing is what we have actually been doing. Even one of some of the vaccines we have tested here, we were giving a boost as a DNA, which is a nucleic acid, a prime as a DNA, and actually boosting with an MVA, which is actually a, a recombinant. So all this is science that we have actually been been going through that. So it is just the understanding that what we need also as a country and as a people is that can we also begin to collect this data? I would like to hear from the obstetricians on this forum. Do we have any data on any women, even if there are five or six pregnant women who have actually been given the, these vaccines? And what can we pick from them now? Because this is what every country is actually doing. Over. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Nzala. And maybe just to, uh, I'll ask Dr. Maritin to also comment on some of the questions. Uh, you've alluded to one on the issue of mixing and matching. And that's, this has been such a frequent question. Uh, and Dr. Maritin, maybe we'll just talk about uh, what the guidance is and what should people be doing in country? What should we practically be doing at this point? Dr. Maritin Karibu. Thank you, Lois, uh, for the questions. So I will start with the, the mix and match question. And globally, we have data to support mix and match. And we know there have been trials that have been done. And also in certain countries, because of um, the issues that were seen with AstraZeneca vaccine, the countries moved, many European countries moved to recommending a different vaccine for a second dose of people who had received their first dose of AstraZeneca vaccine. So now we have ample data. Hello, we can't hear you. So now we have uh, uh, ample data to support mix and The National DC actually has AstraZeneca first dose. Their second dose would also be AstraZeneca. If someone receives a Moderna first, oh, we can't hear you. Um, 
Moderna uh, second, and that one is being given as a one dose. So we um, and matching for J and J. The other question. Okay, the other question is around when to give the COVID vaccine after recovery. And um, the, the national guidance is really when someone has recovered from acute illness, they can receive their COVID vaccine uh, dose once they have met the requirement to, they have completed uh, the isolation requirements. And that's um, as per our isolation requirement guidelines is within 10 days. So um, within 10 days of recovery from acute COVID-19, somebody can actually receive their COVID uh, vaccine. Um, there are different guidelines internationally. The WHO guidelines recommend even a period of six to eight months. But as, our, as per our national uh, COVID-19 deployment guidelines, uh, and the training material that healthcare workers who are in the vaccine centers have received, uh, someone who has recovered uh, from COVID within 10 days can actually receive a first dose of vaccine. And the second dose will come um, as per the stipulated uh, dosing interval. The other question I want to address, this was a question that has been asked by Winnie Mwebia. And this is a very good question that's really asking um, about um, the advice with regard to uh, Ministry of Health and COGS providing an advisory uh, with regard to uh, vaccination of pregnant women because she has rightfully um, uh, seen that most uh, pregnant women and breastfeeding, breastfeeding mothers are turned away from vaccination centers and healthcare workers do not have a very clear advisory on what to do. So to follow up on that, and we had a webinar almost two weeks ago uh, talking about COVID vaccination in pregnancy. And basically we know that COGS, the Kenya Obstetric Gynecological Society already issued an advisory to support vaccination of pregnant women. However, uh, we don't have um, a circular from the Ministry of Health categorically advising on the same. And that is still um, awaited to support uh, that. In the training material for the COVID uh, vaccine deployment task force, what is uh, noted there is that the healthcare worker has to weigh the benefits, has to sort of do a risk assessment. And when the benefits outweigh uh, um, the risks for the mother and fetus, then the vaccine can be recommended. And that really puts healthcare workers at the lowest facilities in a very difficult position. But from this webinar today uh, that we have had the presentation by Dr. Kihara, it is very, very clear that in pregnancy, the benefits of vaccinating the pregnant women outweigh any potential risks because from even what Prof. Anzala has presented, the vaccines and the vaccine platforms are fairly safe in pregnancy. So all pregnant women should actually receive uh, vaccination, but we await a circular or an advisory from the Ministry of Health. And I know there are many people who might be logging in from Ministry of Health and they will maybe pass this message and expedite this discussion. Because even when we had the webinar two weeks ago, we had the same, same uh, conclusion that we need a, an advisory from the Ministry of Health in the form of a circular to all vaccinating centers to advise on healthcare workers on the issue on vaccinating pregnant women and uh, breastfeeding mothers. So those are just, uh, let me hand over back uh, to Lois. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Maritim. I think that's really practical because people are asking this question so often. I think someone has just mentioned that they had a challenge with the network. I've seen it from a few people. And maybe just um, recap briefly on the issue of mixing and what we should be doing locally. Okay. okay, so with regard to, to vaccine mix and matching, we have enough evidence that vaccine mix and matching is possible and uh, has been shown to be safe and effective with good um, efficacy as well. So we have international uh, data to support that. However, at a national policy level, the current policy is um, 
around uh, getting a first dose of one vaccine and receiving the same vaccine for the second dose. So currently, even within our Chanjo system, when somebody receives a first dose of a specific vaccine, they will only receive a second dose of the same vaccine. So in the national uh, deployment plan, it is not supporting mixing and matching. So that's just what I want to say, because we, um, in this forum, we have to sort of like uh, follow what the directives at the national levels provide. So we are not currently mixing and matching vaccines in the country because we have enough second doses for people who receive a first dose of the same uh, vaccine. Thank you very much, Dr. Maritim. I think uh, one of the questions that seems to keep coming over and over is the issue of um, uh, vaccination after COVID-19, and you've answered it really well. Someone is asking, that: does that mean someone needs to be tested before they are vaccinated? What does recovery in this context mean? So we are not testing people even before they receive any COVID vaccine. But if someone has ongoing COVID illness, which is, um, has been confirmed by a laboratory test, then we know there are certain things that followed, follows a COVID uh, positive test. For example, if you test positive, you must isolate so that you're not potentiating or spreading the disease to other people. And that's why the 10 day period interval is to allow that. Some people, when they get the infection, they go through um, the severe forms of illness and they can develop severe illness for which they uh, go on to pneumonia and what um, the other clinical manifestations. So you don't need a test to confirm that you become negative to receive the vaccination because we even changed our, the isolation guidelines to recommend that following a positive test, you need uh, to, um, be away or in isolation for a period of 10 days. And then once the 10 day period, so it's a time-based criteria for the isolation. And therefore you do not require to do a test before you can go and receive the vaccine. Just count 10 days from uh, either the time of diagnosis or uh, the time of which, um, yeah, most often we go by the time of diagnosis. So after the 10 day vaccination action, the most important thing the key time is the 10 days. Thank, thank you very much, Dr. Maritim. I think that is now clear. And uh, I think there's been, I'm trying to find the question. There've been a lot of questions uh, around timing. So someone got their first vaccine, maybe they got pregnant thereafter, they've not been vaccinated. Is it too late? And I think maybe just to answer that one quickly, it's not too late to get your second dose. I think the early data that we had suggested that you know that even the longer the time between the first and the second one, the higher the immune responses. So if you got the first one four months ago, five months ago, go ahead and get your second vaccine. And maybe I'll bring Prof. Anzala back to answer one question. And it's around the issue of a booster vaccine. And someone is asking, do we need to take three injections? They've seen this in other countries. There's been some WHO guidance on this, and maybe just what's your take on uh, what is the benefit of a so-called booster vaccine? Yeah, and thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you, Lois. Actually, uh, before I, I talk about the booster vaccine, I would like to uh, just let colleagues know that at CAVI, <clears throat> we are carrying out a, a study trying to understand uh, the, vac uh, the, the vaccine rollout, but also trying to understand within our own communities uh, the immunization, the immunization yeah, status there. in terms of the. Uh, when a student will come, you as a lecturer, you are one marks. Oh, somebody. And, uh, mute, please. Please. Dr. Pule, please mute yourself. Okay. Yeah, Go ahead. so we have this study where we are uh, bring, bringing in individuals, either if you have had one vaccine or two vaccines, and we want, actually want to look at uh, the vaccine, the immune, immune profiles, to really understand how far the immune, uh, the immune responses go, and also the whole issues of decline. Because it is a whole issue of how quickly the immune responses decline that actually informs the whole issue is that when do we need a booster? 
the, 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 the limited data we have looked at uh, uh, from Israel clearly shows that those over 65 and above, and maybe those with some amount of comorbidities after the second dose within six to seven months, there's quite a big decline, which warrants a booster. And that's why you can actually see that the, the Israel has started boosters. UK is actually in the process of also introducing booster. So what we also need as a country is that let's also understand our own immune, immune response profiles, which will then inform who do we boost and who, we do, and who don't we boost. So boosters are here and boosters are coming. The whole issue will be, it will be actually country specific, depending on the kind of data that has actually been, uh, been collected. So at CABI so far, uh, we have uh, quite a number of individuals coming in and I'd invite any of you to come in so that we have a clear long-term longitudinal study just to find out the immune responses. We are quantitating the antibodies. We are looking at the different subsets you know, of antibodies and this information will actually give us very clear indication of whether we need boosters and who needs a booster. But it also gives us a sense of uh, ex-COVID, especially those who have suffered COVID and have received vaccines, how do their immune responses look like? And we are also uh, bringing together any people with breakthrough infections. We also actually want to understand those who have actually received vaccines, are we getting any breakthrough infections? The answer is yes, but how does that immune response actually look like? And trying to actually couple this with a kind of variant. Everybody's talking about that, the, the Delta variant, uh, that might be true, but we actually want to be able to understand whether the Delta variant is actually the problem with the breakthrough. So all these things are, 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 are ongoing at CAVI, but really Lois, in terms of boosters, boosters are here, but it will be country specific, but each country must then come up with their own data as to how fast the immune response to COVID after vaccination, how fast is, this, is it declining? and to what category of individuals is it declining in order uh, to inform who should get a booster and who should not. Over. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Nzala. I think from a national perspective, we're not giving any boosters yet. Uh, the WHO has sort of issued an advisory sort of against boosters, uh, issued sort of a moratorium against giving boosters until we have as many people as possible vaccinated. So we are yet to see how countries will respond to this advice from the WHO. So for patients who are asking you about whether they need to go for boosters, not yet until, you know, we have a little more information and this further guidance to us. Uh, there are people who are calling to ask, where is J&J being given? I want that one. Or where is Pfizer? I'm waiting for that one. Please encourage people not to wait for the vaccines. The best vaccine is the vaccine available to you now. So get the one you can. I think Prof. Zala very clearly showed us the immune responses to various vaccines. And at the end of the day, they are, one is just as good as the other. So encourage people to go out for the vaccination. I don't know if any of the panelists would like to make a comment or answer any of the questions that may still be there. Please feel free to do that now, even as we come towards a close of this session. Yes. Uh, Dr. Kihara, if you're still with us, Dr. Maureen, I don't know if there's any question that has come, up, come to you that you may want to respond to or any further comments that you may want to give at this point. There is a question. I received my first dose of AstraZeneca. I'm currently 26 weeks pregnant. Do I need to get my second dose? The answer would be yes. It is safer to prevent COVID than to actually suffer the aftermath of COVID. And particularly we have seen in pregnancy in the third trimester, which is what this particular client is getting to, we have a worse sequelae when COVID does attack you. Uh, thank you. Excellent response. So, um, Dr. Kosigai, do you want to make any comments? Mine is to say thank you for everyone who has listened and to remember that vaccination is key. We should recommend to our patients. 
Um, mm. So I think you will all agree with me that this has been a fantastic session. We want to thank each of our presenters and all our panelists for even responding to the questions. Um, and, you know, for just tackling this issue. We continue with this series on pregnancy, looking at different aspects, and we'll continue with this for the next couple of uh, webinars. So please feel free, next week we'll still have a webinar looking at different cases, looking at different complex scenarios and how to manage those. So please feel free to join and to share the invitation with others as well. If you have any questions that you're not able to ask in the webinar, you feel free to send them to us and we'll try and handle them at the next webinar. So thank you, everyone. Um, thank you to all the panelists for sparing us a few minutes. Uh, so we finished a little early today and we wish you all an excellent weekend. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>